It's a real life night at the museum, but it's not just a security guard shining a light on the skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. This is a sleepover and it's bringing hundreds of overnight adventurers to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. The event takes place once a month. Arrival time is 6 o'clock p.m. Wake up call the next morning is 7 a.m. In between, at least before the lights go out at around midnight, are scavenger hunts, flashlight tours, trivia and karaoke and many of the campers get to sleep on cots beneath a massive blue whale. It's neither cheap nor a brand new idea. The cost for a child and an adult is $450 and it started back in 2006. But when COVID came to America, engagements like this were shut down and the night at the museum just recently restarted. Most of these folks said they were excited to be here, but the event has at least one critic. It's crazy to sleep. Like, I don't know who would come up with this crazy idea. I like it, but I feel like it would be dumb. Still, the museum says the event is sold out for the next two months. Hi, I'm Carl Azus for The World from A to Z. Not since record keeping began in 1851 has a storm as powerful as Hurricane Melissa struck the island of Jamaica. It blew ashore in the southwestern part of the country early Tuesday afternoon with wind speeds of 185 miles per hour. Category 5 hurricane strength, the strongest classification, starts with 157 mile per hour winds. Jamaica's prime minister says there's no infrastructure on the island that could withstand that strength. And that was only one part of the danger. Another was the storm surge, the rise in seawater levels blown ashore by an approaching hurricane. That was expected to bring the water as much as 13 feet higher than it normally is on the coast. And then there are the rains. Jamaica is a mountainous country, and that makes it prone to landslides and flooding when hurricanes hit. Melissa was cutting a diagonal path across the western part of Jamaica and appeared to be headed towards southeastern Cuba last night, where it was expected to make landfall by this morning. Evacuations were planned there for half a million people. Warm water is a fuel source for hurricanes. Over land, they usually weaken. That's what Melissa did to Category 4 status with 150 mile per hour winds as it roared over Jamaica. One way meteorologists get measurements like this is by flying into the eye of the storm. And this is what Melissa's eye wall looked like as a U.S. Air Force Reserve Hurricane Hunter plane flew through it on Monday. These airborne laboratories capture critical weather information from all corners of a storm. This crisscross pattern that you see here allows for weather conditions to be sampled at different altitudes and quadrants of a hurricane. At this stage, the storm could be rapidly strengthening. Significant drops in pressure and increases in wind speed are adding stresses to the aircraft. Now, the crew can experience extreme turbulence with drops in altitude of hundreds of feet in a matter of seconds. The plane descends to 10,000 feet so they can punch through the eye wall, the strongest part of the storm where winds can exceed 150 miles per hour. And just like that, conditions go eerily quiet. The clouds clear above them as the air descends into the center of the storm, creating a stadium effect, where the towering clouds of the eye wall surrounding the storm's clear center and create the look of a stadium. Wow, you could see all the way to the blue sky. At this point, the navigator marks the center of the storm, an important waypoint for predicting the future path of a hurricane. While a device known as a drop zone is released from the belly of the plane, this little instrument transmits crucial weather data back to the plane as it falls all the way down to the ocean surface. That data is analyzed by meteorologists and computers back at the National Hurricane Center, helping to create the updated forecast that you see at home so you can make informed decisions ahead of the storm. Upward and out. Which of these international organizations was founded in 1863? United Nations, Red Cross, League of Nations, Interpol. Founded in Geneva, Switzerland in 1863, and the oldest organization on this list is the International Committee of the Red Cross. On this date in world history, it was 
on October 29th in 1863 that the International Committee of the Red Cross was established. Organizing better care for wounded troops in war, regardless of the side they were on, was the committee's overarching goal. Exactly 60 years later, the nation of Turkey officially became a republic. It was born out of what remained of the Ottoman Empire, and October 29th is celebrated annually as Turkey's Republic Day. And this date in 1929 was known as Black Tuesday, one of the days of panic in the U.S. stock market crash of that year. Prices collapsed as more than 16 million shares were traded, and in the months that followed, the Great Depression set in. October 29th was also the date 10 years ago when China announced the end of its controversial one-child policy. The change officially took effect the next year. It was put in place in the late 1970s to try to slow population growth in what was then the most populated country. The one-child policy did slow birth rates in China, but today the communist country has an aging population with fewer young people entering the workforce to take on needed positions. And the economic crisis expected from that is just one side effect of the policy. China is a massive nation, both in landmass and in population. For centuries, it's been the most populated country in the world, and always growing. But about four decades ago, China worried it was growing too fast, so the Communist Party government put in place a one-child per family policy. If parents broke this regulation, they faced consequences, paying fines, losing their job, or sometimes forced abortions. The traditional preference in Chinese culture is to have male children. With only one child allowed, this meant baby girls were often abandoned, left at orphanages, or even killed. Now China finds itself with a massive gender disparity in the population. Not enough women. Part of the price the nation paid to slow population growth. Now it's created the opposite problem, though. Not enough growth. So in 2016, the one-child policy was changed to allow two kids. The effects of this increase were short-lived. Birth rates rose for a couple years, but then they dropped again. It's because China's society developed around the one-child policy. Generations are used to small families, where the parents pour into their child, and later in life, the child will take care of them. Another factor is the overwhelming need to succeed in China. It leaves no extra time or resources to be spent on having more children. Many parents would rather give one child more advantages than spread their resources among several kids. So population growth kept dropping. China's next solution? Add another kid. Families can now have three children. But based on lack of response to the two-child limit, it's unlikely this latest update will make a difference either. Not until parents are given actual incentives to have more kids. China's central government did start offering incentives over the summer. For the first time, parents can receive $500 per year for each child they have under age three. This follows incentives offered by some local governments throughout the country, which might have included money and reduced housing and education costs. China's government-controlled media say the new payments will help more than 20 million families afford to raise children, but critics say it's still too little and won't have much of an impact. Over the past three years, China's overall population has continued to shrink. Want to thank everyone who's subscribed to our YouTube channel. Commenting under each show is one way to get mentioned here, and that's what Mr. Diamond and Mr. Hills class did. Springfield Clark Career Technology Center is watching and awesome from Springfield, Ohio. One state north is Michigan, where we're swimming with the sharks of T.S. Nurnberger Middle School. Hello to Mrs. Woods class in the city of St. Louis. And we'll sail into the sunset with the Clippers. Great to see Mr. Tussing or Tuzing and his students at James M. Bennett High School. It's in Salisbury, Maryland. A couple hundred miles south of Indonesia is an Australian territory named Christmas Island. Europeans sighted it and named it on Christmas Day, 1643. One thing it's famous for is the annual migration of red crabs. More than 100 million of them make their way sideways from the forest to the ocean. This typically happens after the first rainfall of the wet season, usually in October or November. Once they reach the beach, the females lay eggs after mating, release those eggs later into a receding tide, and the babies that aren't eaten by fish or whale sharks will eventually travel back inland to grow and replenish the population.
For the fish, the crab dip is a sight to sushi. When they see the crabs beginning to line up on the sand, they start dreaming of crab cakes, crab salad, crab claws, and crab rolls on the soft shell. They're simply rangoony for crab roll and think it's the dungeon essence of culinary conquest to eat like kings when the red crabs flower, watching every leg of their journey with bated breath. Wednesdays are mid. I'm Carl Azuz, and I'm going to claw my way out of today's show, but not before thanking you for watching the world from A to Z.